that on. Good morning, everyone. We will call the uh, commission to order. Uh, our purpose of meeting today is to uh, discuss the proposed franchise as put forth by CenturyLink and your negotiating committee. And so uh, I would like to, this is a public hearing, and so what I would like to do is uh, first of all have um, our attorney, Mr. Bradley, give an overview of things, and then uh, after that, I would like to um, call for a, a motion to open a public hearing to take input from residents and other interested individuals. So, um, Mr. Bradley, do you want to start out? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, first, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, just thank a few people here before we get going. This has been a, uh, a long process here in, in negotiating the franchise with, uh, with CenturyLink, and I did want to thank the Commission first for um, asking our firm to to help uh, your organization negotiate um, this franchise. Um, I'd specifically like to thank the negotiating committee and, and Mike Johnson uh, for all of their assistance in um, in getting us through um, the negotiating process and, and getting this franchise before you today. And, um, and then internally, uh, of course, Adrian Herbst and uh, Leslie Saparito have been um, uh, tremendous assistance um, to me as um, as all of us have been going forward in uh, in these negotiations and finally um, I'd like to thank uh, Patrick Haggerty and, and CenturyLink and, and Tyler Middleton of course uh, for all of their efforts in, um, in getting us to where we are today um, I did prepare um, a PowerPoint presentation which unfortunately for CenturyLink is directly behind them <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Um, but anyway, I, uh, I did want to go through a few things just to kind of remind all of you the process that we've been uh, following, talk a little bit about the, the cable franchise itself, and then talk about the, the next steps that, um, that you'll be able to take now. Um, so to give you a reminder of the process that we've uh, followed um, from the time CenturyLink asked uh, the commission to uh, consider um, a cable franchise application. Uh, the commission initially published a notice of intent to franchise, which is required by state statute. Um, uh, after that, CenturyLink uh, submitted a cable franchise application. Once that happened, then um, the commission uh, asked uh, Leslie Saparito to prepare uh, an ap application analysis, which, which was done. Uh, and eventually it was received and filed by the commission and the commission authorized um, staff to negotiate, uh, staff and the negotiating committee to negotiate a, a cable franchise. Some of the things that, um, that we consider in these competitive cable franchises um, here in Minnesota is, um, you know, there's kind of a number of things, but these are kind of the, the high level kind of top considerations that are that go into these um, discussions. One is is how to address the build out of each member city. Remember that uh, CenturyLink has already built out really all of your member cities with a legacy communication system. And when we're talking about building out, we're really talking about CenturyLink upgrading its facilities to allow it to provide a video service on its existing system, and in some cases, upgrading uh, new facilities all the way to the, the premises. Prohibiting cherry picking or economic redlining, so not uh, allowing a company to just focus on perhaps wealthier areas of a city, but having, a, um, having the system being provided to a broad base of subscribers throughout every member city. In, in Minnesota, there's a level playing field statute in the cable, um, in the cable um, chapter on, on cable franchising. And that level playing field requires that the franchises between an incumbent franchise, which is Comcast, and then the, the, the new franchise, which in this case is CenturyLink, um, they have to be substantially similar um, in three uh, primary areas, and that's um, franchise fees, uh, area served, and then uh, PEG requirements. Um, 
And then another consideration is the incumbents cable franchise, which is the Comcast franchise. So all of these things have been, um, you know, in the mix of our discussions um, all throughout this time. A couple of uh, significant issues that we had to, to get over first was, um, um, was how, how to address the, the build out. And, and the reason why that's a, um, a challenging issue is because there's a state statute in place that requires um, that initial cable franchises have language that basically say that a, um, uh, the, the cable operator has to build out its entire system um, you know, within five years and so many plant miles a year. Um, CenturyLink had indicated that they felt that that language was preempted uh, by federal law and federal rules. And um, in the initial application analysis and then again in the staff report that is in your packet today, um, they, they provided what we thought was a good faith basis for that argument. Um, and then in addition to that, CenturyLink agreed to indemnify um, the commission if there was any litigation on that or any other issues surrounding the granting of this franchise. And so with those protections in mind, um, we, we deviated from that, um, that build um, requirement. But that leaves you uh, still with the, um, with the federal law requirement of, uh, of having the ability to have a reasonable build out. Um, uh, provision in your cable franchise, and that's what we focused on uh, for the for the build out. So when we turn then to the to the build out of the of the cable system, um, in the cable franchise, the goal then is to have um, service being provided to all of your member cities <coughs> and your entire member, you know, the entirety of each member city uh, over the next five years. So during this five year term. Um, the build-out goal is to is for everybody to receive cable service. It is, however, based on on the, the market-based success that CenturyLink um, has over the next five years um, in competing against um, uh, Comcast. So, then um, the reason why it's based on uh, a market-based success model is because the FCC in a in an order from 2007 that addressed cable, competitive cable franchising. It said that in addressing reasonable build out of a city, it's, it is reasonable to consider market-based success. And so that's why we chose that particular model. Um, as part of the, the build out, um, there is a requirement that there be a significant investment um, targeted to um, to all areas of the city, including areas below the uh, median income of, of each member city. So that kind of addresses that economic redlining uh, argument. So the initial build out commitment is 15% um, of each member city um, over the first um, two years. And, um, and, and I've said this before, this, this is, um, this was lower than, frankly, we would have liked when we initially started looking at these cable franchises, but I can tell you that this is the model that's being used throughout the Twin Cities. I can also tell you that CenturyLink would not agree to um, anything above that initial build of, of 15%. But there are provisions that we'll go over here shortly that allow an accelerated uh, build um, over time, again, based on market-based success. But with that, um, that initial build is 15% of each of your member cities over the first two years of the franchise. Um, they have to use their best efforts to do it in a shorter period of time. Um, uh, there's an equitable deployment to all households in the city and has to include a significant number of households below the median income. Um, and CenturyLink is permitted to serve more than that 15%. And of course, we want to encourage that 100% of households get served in your member cities. There'll be quarterly meetings, so you'll start hearing about quarterly meetings now, um, uh, assuming that a franchise is um, granted to, to CenturyLink. Um, starting in uh, January of 2017, although we may want to push that out because 
um, if we take action that approves the franchise, the, this franchise won't become effective, I think, until November 26th. Um, so we're not going to get a lot of information on January 1. Um, but the commitment is starting in, in January, we'll have quarterly meetings with CenturyLink. At those quarterly meetings, CenturyLink will come in and, and show exactly where they're providing service, what their penetration rates are, um, what the number of uh, what number of households below the median income are being served by uh, CenturyLink at the present time? They'll also show, um, you know, what their expectations are for, you know, moving uh, forward into the following quarter. So it's a good opportunity to um, see exactly where they are. They will provide some maps showing where they are, so you'll get an idea of, you know, where people are able to receive service where we think service will be um, brought in the near future and then where there's still work to be done. So you'll see all of that in these, in these quarterly meetings. And they're very helpful because you also can talk about, you know, any issues that are coming up, uh, if there's any customer service issues that, that need to be addressed. It's just a nice check-in uh, with, a, with a new operator. Those quarterly meetings are also the basis for a provision for accelerated, uh, an accelerated build out of your, of your member cities. So the example that we use in, in your franchise is that if, if CenturyLink comes in and shows that they, they've already exceeded that 15% number, let's say they've, they've, um, they've hit um, 60%, and they're having market-based success, which is, a 27 and a half percent uh, penetration rate, you know, within that um, within that 60 uh, percent. If they hit those numbers, so they're showing market-based success, they're having a, they're at a, a level that's higher than that 15 percent already. Then that uh, that build out will accelerate. Then it'll take the 60 percent baseline and then put another 15 percent um, build out commitment. On, uh, on CenturyLink, and so then they'll be required to serve 75%. So there's, there's a built-in acceleration of the build-out uh, in the cable franchise. Um, there's no line extension policies um, un unless CenturyLink becomes uh, the dominant provider, which means they have more cable subscribers than any other franchise cable operator. Economic redlining um, is absolutely prohibited under federal law. Um, we also have provisions in the cable franchise that uh, prohibit it. We have an additional uh, damage uh, provision that addresses uh, redlining and build out. Um, so we think we've, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've addressed that issue adequately. On level playing field, like I said, there's there's three areas under the state statute that we that we look at. One is franchise fees, one's area served, and one are the PEG requirements. The franchise fees um, uh, have CenturyLink paying the same percentage of gross revenues as Comcast, so they're um, they're essentially identical. The area served is also comparable to the Comcast franchise in that the area. Um, being authorized to be served are the entire um, areas of all of your member cities, the entire corporate boundaries. The PEG requirements um, are a little bit different between the, uh, between the companies, but we think overall they balance out and, um, and, and are fair to both companies. The, the number of access channels that CenturyLink will be providing to the Commission um, is 13, and that's actually a greater number of access channels than Comcast provides. Part of the reason for that is there's some narrow casting that goes on, and I'm sure you're all familiar with narrow casting. I'll try to, for the public's sake, try to identify what narrow casting is. But essentially, there is a, uh, a channel on Comcast system. Um, let's, let's just say it's channel 18, and I'm not sure, I don't remember which channel it is. But, um, and that channel is dedicated to each member city. So everybody gets a channel uh, 18 in my example, um, but it's different. So each member city sees a different feed. CenturyLink isn't able to do that. And so the solution that, that they have is to provide a, a channel for each of those member cities. So those feeds 
um, will go out to all of the member cities and in fact across the entire metro uh, area um, with those access feeds. The format of the access channels is also different than what Comcast provides. Comcast um, provides um, I think up to two access channels in high definition. CenturyLink is capable of providing all of your access channels uh, in high definition. So um, I'm sure you've all been around and, and, the, and the commission has probably wanted for years to be, um, to be all high definition. And now we have a company here that's willing to provide all of your um, access television channels in high definition. Um, there's an electronic programming guide commitment. This, uh, this commitment is different than Comcast's commitment. Um, Comcast um, provides detailed programming on uh, electronic programming guide. CenturyLink is providing us that capability, but is not providing the cost uh, for that. So that is a difference um, in, between the two cable franchises. The channel placement is, um, is, an, is another difference. Um, all of our access channels will be available through uh, channel 49, which will be called the Northwest Mosaic Channel. And, um, and through that channel 49, you'll be able to access all 13 of the access channels um, in kind of a picture-in-picture -picture type of um, format on the, on the CenturyLink system. Um, in addition to the access channels, you'll also be able to um, you'll also be able to receive the local origination channel. Um, and then all of those access channels will physically be located in the 8,000 um, tier of channels. And that's where all of the access channels for the entire Twin Cities area are located. It is kind of an, uh, a neat deal with, uh, with CenturyLink in that you can receive the, the access channels from all of the cities across the metro um, on your TV in, um, in a franchised area. So uh, if a franchise is granted a CenturyLink here and you start to receive their service, you'll be able to see the access channels in uh, the city of Minneapolis, city of St. Paul, um, Coon Rapids, Shakopee, all over, the, um, all over the Twin City. So it's kind of a neat, uh, something that's very different than what you uh, receive with Comcast right now. Um, some additional access requirements. There's a PSA requirement. Uh, the video on demand has been a, an issue for many, many uh, years. You, uh, you, have a, you have some video on demand with Comcast now. I think it's five hours of, um, of SD, uh, standard definition um, programming. Uh, this far exceeds that. They're, they're providing 25 hours of video on demand for every uh, member city, so that ends up being 225 hours of uh, video on demand programming, and it's not limited to um, SD programming. And finally, the, um, the PEG support. The PEG support is going to be um, identical for subscribers um, when they're paying their, their bill. Comcast um, charges subscribers $1.43, and that's exactly what CenturyLink will be um, charging its subscribers and paying to the, um, to the commission. Um, the local origination channel is something that's uh, fairly unique to this um, commission area, and we were able to um, negotiate uh, a, a local origination channel and kind of similar terms to how um, Comcast is providing that local origination channel. It will be on channel 241. Uh, it will be seen by, uh, again, members of the public or, or uh, CenturyLink cable subscribers throughout the Twin Cities metropolitan area. So that channel now will have a much broader audience than it currently has. Um, it will also be seen on the Northwest Mosaic, like I said, on channel 49 but it'll also be uh, able to be pulled up through other mosaics that CenturyLink has, such as their uh, news mosaic and their sports mo mosaic. So um, some really kind of different and unique things that um, uh, are going into the local origination channel as well. And then finally, uh, CenturyLink will be paying for the uh, detailed electronic programming guide information for the, um, for the local origination channel. 
One of the very unique things that have been ne negotiated here um, is the Twin Cities Metro PEG Interconnect Network. That's a network that CenturyLink has agreed to construct um, to allow PEG stations or access channel um, programmers to share live programming with one another. So if, um, the example that I've, I've used um, in the past is, is sports programming. So if we have a, a, sports, a high school sports team that's playing in another area, let's say Roseville, um, and Roseville's covering that game, uh, the commission will have the ability to pick up that programming live and put it on its own channel. So subscribers in this area will be able to go to the channel it normally goes to for sports programming and pick it up that way. It's a very unique um, uh, arrangement for, for PEG operators. We're very fortunate here, I think, in the Twin Cities to have a very vibrant um, PEG community or access television community. And, um, and CenturyLink, um, you know, I think recognized that and then did, a, um, did some really hard work to, to make this, this happen. So this is not a, an inexpensive um, um, project that, that CenturyLink is going through and, and hopefully it'll be widely utilized by the PEG operators here in the Twin Cities. I can tell you in, in speaking around the country on competitive franchising, um, this is the envy of a lot of uh, communities across the country. They're very interested in, in how this works. Uh, CenturyLink's also agreed to provide complimentary broadband uh, to uh, one location within each member city. Uh, that uh, each member city will have a choice of uh, of where that uh, location will be, uh, but they will need to work um, with Mike Johnson and they'll need to work with CenturyLink as well. So there'll need to be some communication there as far as um, what location it'll be at. Um, you know, and part of that will be um, centered around where CenturyLink can provide service right now and what kind of speeds. But it is, um, it'll be free broadband, it'll also be free Wi Fi equipment. Um, uh, at these at these locations, and so there's the possibility of having free one gig um, internet speeds um, at these locations, but it's not guaranteed to be one gig. I've kind of already gone through a lot of the comparisons, so I, I'm not going to go over um, um, these slides in, in real, real detail because we've really already gone over them. But the franchises. Uh, when you compare the Comcast franchise to the CenturyLink franchise, they are very similar um, documents, um, with some of the exceptions that I've kind of gone over already this morning. The term of the cable franchise is going to be uh, different in that um, we've kept the CenturyLink term to five years. The, the real reason for that is, um, is to, to keep an eye on the, uh, the build out of the of the cable uh, franchise to make sure that all members of the public uh, in these member cities are getting served. And um, with that shorter term, we'll be able to go into renewal at a, you know, in a, in a little bit sooner than we would with a longer term franchise. And if, if we need to address build out differently at that time, then we can explore that. Um, customer service is similar. There is that identification provision that I touched on that uh, CenturyLink is providing that uh, Comcast does not provide. Uh, I've already gone over the access commitments. There is also a provision on um, serving public buildings uh, in the cable franchise. Uh, the penalties are very similar between the, the two operators, but like I mentioned before, there is one additional a uh, penalty provision for CenturyLink related to redlining and, and build-out. Uh, and then, of course, the build-out provisions I went into ad nauseum, so I won't bore you with those again. Um, and we really have gone over all of these as well. So uh, our next steps then um, is to hold this public hearing. Um, so after, um, after my pre presentation, we'll We'll ask CenturyLink uh, if it has any remarks that it would like to make, uh, and then it'll be opened um, to the public for uh, any public testimony. 
uh, at which time the public hearing will be closed. And then the commission will have the opportunity to uh, consider the cable franchise uh, of CenturyLink. Uh, if it decides to, if the commission decides to grant a franchise to CenturyLink, um, uh, the, there, there's a publication requirement. So the soonest that, um, that the franchise can be published is on um, October 27th. Um, that'll be within the 15 days of granting the franchise if that's the will of the commission. And then the franchise becomes effective 30 days after that uh, publication date, which is Saturday, November 26th. Um, and I think that's, I think that's it. So uh, if there's any questions of me, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions as well. CenturyLink, have any comments? <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Tyler Middleton. I'm CenturyLink's Vice President of Operations for Minnesota. Just wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, CenturyLink made the decision back in, uh, actually it was early 2014 already, um, to bring uh, choice and competition in the cable market to the Twin Cities and initiated an awful lot of activities back in that time to start talking to the various, uh, as it turns out, 72 cities in the greater Twin Cities area. Uh, to build the, the video head ends, to bring the content, both national and local content, into this marketplace, and to start the ramp up of systems and, and resources and people uh, to prepare for that launch. And so in uh, June of 2015, we were fortunate enough to uh, have the first city of the city of Minneapolis uh, be the first city to, to bring uh, Prism Television to this marketplace. And uh, throughout that process and, and to this day, we've continued the process to invest what has been hundreds of millions of dollars to, um, in, in the overall operation and capital involved in bringing it to this market. And very proud to say at this time, we now have, um, in advance of, of this commission, we've got 42 of those cities um, have ordinances in place where we are offering service. Uh, by the end of this year, our expectation is that we will have enabled uh, right around 400,000 households out of 1.1 million in the greater Twin Cities area capable of carrying PRISM uh, through both the, the technology and where that overlays where the franchises happen to be. So we've uh, been very, very busy um, installing new customers. Um, I think it's been a very successful rollout. It's, it's met our our, uh, our business objectives from that perspective. And uh, we're just real pleased to, to be here and have the opportunity to serve the uh, Northwest Suburban Cable Commission as well. So we appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to have a formal motion to open the public hearing to take input from the public. So moved. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Been made and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay, carries. Again, this is a public hearing. We're seeking input uh, from any individuals that do want to respond to this uh, proposed franchise agreement. This is the first time since, uh, I believe, 1984 that uh, we've uh, had this opportunity to take a look at another franchise agreement. Uh, the, the, last, uh, the last one we did consider was WH Link, but that was uh, for Plymouth and, and Maple Grove, and that was the cherry picking. They only wanted to go into certain exclusive neighborhoods and uh, certainly that didn't fit the legal obligations so this is a, a good experience for us since 1984 it's been, been a long time so we'd like to have input from the public that uh, would like to comment on this proposed franchise we have a microphone in the corner there uh, if you wish to speak give us your name and address for the record and we'll take your comments Any comments from the public? Any comments from the public? Good morning. I'm a board member with the rest of you. Scott Burdett. Um, I'd like to hear more information on the cable guide. Uh, what we are required to provide on the cable guide as opposed to just say, you know, there wasn't much information there and that's actually very, very critical. I can address that, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Th there's, there's two pieces to that uh, electronic programming guide. Um, first on the uh, local origination channel, um, uh, CenturyLink will, um, will pay for, um, for the detailed programming uh, listings for that, for that local origination channel. So just like you see with broadcast television, you'll see the, the segments, as long, as long as we provide them to the um, third party provider. Um, as you may know, um, the cable operators use, you know, they don't do the electronic programming guide themselves, they hire somebody else to do them. So what they do is they put um, our organization in touch with their third party provider. They um, help coordinate that, um, you know, that initial handoff so that we're able to provide that detailed information to um, the third party provider. So, um, so at the end of the day, what CenturyLink is paying for is for that detailed segmented um, uh, programming guide uh, for the local origination channel. On the uh, access channels themselves, um, we'll still have that opportunity to provide segmented uh, detailed programming guide information that cost will be a cost to the commission. Okay. Any other comments from the public? Hi, <clears throat> uh, Dave Carlson with uh, Wyzetta Public Schools in uh, Plymouth. I just wanted a <clears throat> clarification, please, of the uh, number of access channels. You said 13, mm -hmm. but if each city gets one, that's nine. Uh, the Wyzetta and Robbinsdale School Districts share one, so there would be another one, and the Osseo School District has an educational access channel. So that leaves only two, um, but there are more than that right now mm -hmm. with the current franchise. Is the local origination right. channel not included in that it uh, is not. number? The, the local origination channel is not included in that number. Okay, so there would be two remaining for Northwest Community TV. <coughs> <coughs> Any other comments? Mark McGuire, um, Crystal. 4601 Xenia for the address. Uh, I had a question. What is the infrastructure that you're, I guess, going to build out? Is it fiber optic cables that is going to provide the PRISM TV? And if so, isn't there already fiber optic cable already for internet? And can that carry both? Yes, that's a good question. Um, as Mr. Bradley indicated, um, we've got a, obviously a legacy network um, in the area. And PRISM television is delivered um, over our IP network, our internet network. So it's a combination of um, utilizing what it was called our fiber to the node architecture, which is kind of fiber in the backbone and then copper to the home. Okay. So long as it's been prepared for the PRISM uh, service and has speeds at 25 megabits per second or greater. Or it can uh, operate over our our newer fiber to the home network, which has taken that same fiber backbone and extended fiber all the way to the household. So it's, it's kind of architecture independent in that regard, and really wherever, in the net of it, wherever we can offer 25 megabits or greater. Does that answer your question? Yes, great. Thank you. I'm Zipporah. I'm too short, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Zipporah Misesi, board member and a producer at the Northwest Community Television for six years. My show plays in four different stations, and I love it that Northwest is my original station, and I want to maintain that. On sharing the programs, it has been my, I took it as a challenge to send to the three other stations about, apart from Northwest, either online or DVD, and I'm glad that they always play my show, sharing the program, and I wanted to know if their Northwest is playing my show four o'clock on Monday. Will, can I tell the other stations also to do that? Because I, I doubt whether they can do that because there could be something else that is gonna play at four o'clock. Just wanted to know, is this gonna help me not to worry anymore to send my shows to the other stations or I still have to continue sending my show to the other stations? 
Mr. Chair, I can answer that. Uh, Zipporah, the uh, Commissioner of MSSA, we, uh, because uh, the unique uh, infrastructure of CenturyLink uh, allows us to, uh, through this mosaic, basically, in this case, everybody would be able to see your program if it airs out of this building who has CenturyLink um, Prism TV service. And whatever time you play it here would be the time that it would air all over the Twin Cities. So it's, it's a huge plus for uh, community producers um, that they can see it simultaneously at that time slot. Good, so that relieves me from <clears throat> having to send the other stations. Yes. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's big relief. <laughs> Yeah, yes, of course, unless they're uh, Comcast customers only, then you would still have to, so. Okay, Just that a <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from the public? If not, uh, oh, we've got one more up here. Sorry, sorry. Uh, one other question, the fiber to the home, as a CenturyLink subscriber currently, uh, who provides the cost of running it all the way to the home? Is it the homeowner or CenturyLink? But where, wherever we are provisioning it, we, we pay for the cost all the way to the home. Any other comments? Any other comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Carries. We have two. Uh, motions that need to be made um, based on the affirmative review by the commission. The first one, as proposed by Mr. Bradley, is a motion to receive and file the staff report dated October 20, 2016, including the exhibits. So I would like to have a motion to that effect. Second. Bill, Jim, or Jim and Bill. Um, any other comments on that? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. The second motion is a little bit longer. Um, so bear with me. Uh, the second motion would be to approve the cable franchise ordinance and agreement with CenturyLink, approve the findings of fact contained in the packet, approve the ordinance summary contained in the packet, and direct the executive director to publish the ordinance summary. So like to make that motion and add on to it and direct signature of all required documents by our appropriate officers and okay. uh, employees. Okay, so noted. Is there a second to that? Motion's been made and seconded with that addition. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. I want to thank uh, CenturyLink and realize it's been since, since 2014, but I don't know what we're going to do now for fun, but uh, <laughs> we're still we'll figure out something. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank, uh, yes. Go ahead. I just had a question. You can finish your statement. But. No, I was just going to thank uh, uh, Leslie, Mike and Mike, Dave, our entire great staff, and I want to thank the negotiating committee for the hours that uh, were put forth working out this uh, franchise agreement. So I appreciate everybody's hard work and dedication and appreciate the hard work and dedication by the commission as a whole. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, be, uh, this is for CenturyLink is, you know, in our city of Crystal, we're having some street reconstruction projects. And I'm just wondering, like next spring, for instance, the streets are gonna be dug up around the airport area. Is that an opportunity to come in and put in some lines, you know, at a less reduced cost? Would I mean, are you working with the, the cities in the area as they're doing the street reconstruction to see if you can um, increase coverage areas? Well, when I, I the, don't. The infrastructure is already being worked on. Yeah, um, that's a it's a good su suggestion. We we frequently work with the cities. I don't know specific to Crystal, but um, typically the city engineers are in touch with our engineering and planning teams, and if the opportunity presents itself where we can we can take advantage of that, then we need to know. Um, well, you know, far enough in advance that we can plan for it and see if it makes sense from a okay. business perspective. I'm going to talk. <coughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Joanna. Joni. I was just wondering, uh, do you have an idea about viewership? Um, will people just be changing from Comcast to CenturyLink, or 
do you see a uh, increase of uh, viewership and do you uh, have you thought about what that might be well, I think what's, and maybe uh, CenturyLink can also answer this question too, is basically what they're going to have to do is win customers, I think you use the term win customers away from, from Comcast. Obviously there are probably uh, subscribers out there, uh, or, or people who are not subscribing to cable, maybe they at one point they dropped Comcast for whatever reason, but through um, CenturyLink's marketing efforts and advertising so forth and so on and, and pricing, people might come on, you know, back on board to say a landline type cable service versus just getting satellite service or whatever. So it, it's, we're not, as it stands right now, we're not expecting uh, a, a huge increase in the number of subscribers because it's, it, there could be a lot of this uh, trade out one for one. If they win a customer from Comcast, then it's kind of revenue neutral for us, if that makes sense. We just had, did a um, city survey in Golden Valley, and we were, uh, Northwest Television wasn't as uh, high in the percent of people that watched it, uh, which kind of goes along with what we've heard. And I'm just hoping that maybe uh, bringing another alternative will be able to increase mm -hmm. the viewership back, right. you know, uh, up, so. Right, because remember, about roughly the, the, the penetration rate of uh, cable services in the northwest suburbs is a little over 50%. So in, in every one of your cities, there's at least nearly half of the people don't have a landline service. Now, that could grow with, with CenturyLink, so we'll see. Another Time opportunity, because I do know that um, over the last couple years, there has been a, a big interest in having a choice here and people not happy with Comcast and they want a choice. And I think this is going to be very positive because competition never hurts anybody. Right. And uh, I hope both uh, CenturyLink and Comcast step up to the plate and um, you know, give us uh, good service in our communities because I think with one, it's just not yeah. as you know, you're, you're the only one, you don't have to try as hard. So I think this is going to be a positive endeavor, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, if I may, okay. uh, not only add to the question that was answered, but first I'd like to thank the Commission as well. I've spent a lot of hours at this location. They've been uh, mostly enjoyable, but uh, what, <laughs> I, what I have taken away from it is this is an extremely engaged Commission very professional, very representative of their communities, and that's both ex respected and admired. I've, as Tyler pointed out, we've done 42 of these, so I've had my experiences around this, and, and I, it was a pleasure to work with this commission, Mr. Bradley and uh, Mr. Separito. Um, to add to your, you, you had asked about an increase in viewership, and one thing I might just add to Mr. Johnson's uh, comments and, and Mr. Bradley had pointed out is we broadcast, we don't narrowcast. So I think the opportunity for uh, subscribers outside of your independent communities to see your programming is going to be incredible. Um, an opportunity to market your communities outside of the community so people in uh, residents in other uh, out cities outside of, of Maple Grove or, or um, would be able to see the program and so I do think there'll be an increase in viewership and an opportunity for this commission to really promote <laughs> what happens in the member cities of this commission and uh, bring interest to that. Thank you Patrick. Bill. So I have a question um, about our relative size in the Twin Cities. This um, nine member community now, where will we rank, let's just say everybody has the exact same penetration rate throughout the Twin Cities, Will we be behind Minneapolis and St. Paul as third, or will we be in second place, or how, how large are we as compared to everybody else of your 42 communities? It, it, it's a good question, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, and it's actually uh, almost incredible. The, the nine member cities of this commission will fall between Minneapolis and St. Paul, a little bit uh, smaller than, than Minneapolis itself, but larger than St. Paul. So this is uh, a significant day for CenturyLink and Tyler and I. Um, this is a big one. <laughs> 
Julie? I just have one more question. When will you start kind of marketing to the community that you're going to be available to sell the? It's that, that's a good question, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. As uh, Mr. Bradley had pointed out, the effective date for the franchise is October 26th. Mm -hmm. um, we have households currently ready to flip the switch, as people might say. Uh, once we've done that, which will be very shortly after the effective date, in fact, we'll go to work on preparing to do that now. Um, residents that can subscribe to the service will begin receiving direct mail flyers within weeks of, okay. of that effective okay. date. Um, and that'll be a way for residents to, to know whether or not they can subscribe would be that they've received direct mail promoting the product. Um, the other way that uh, residents can uh, determine whether or not they can subscribe to services through our website, CenturyLink.com. They can submit their address to the website. The website will immediately provide a response as to whether they do or do not uh, uh, are enabled to, to receive the service. And if they are not enabled to receive the service, they can submit their email address so that uh, as we do enable uh, additional households, they would be notified that they now qualify. So is it October 26th or November 26th? November. Oh, November. I'm November. sorry. Okay. Wishful thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? <coughs> if not, uh, anything else to come before the commission, uh, Mike? Uh, not before the commission. Again, I would like to thank uh, both uh, um, Mike Bradley and Leslie Saparito as well, the entire negotiating committee, the commission, and uh, definitely CenturyLink uh, uh, working with uh, your firm has uh, uh, we've gotten through it. It's been a long time, but we're very excited that uh, it's finally come to fruition. So thank you very much. Okay. Entertain a motion to adjourn the commission meeting. Make a motion. Motion's been made. There's a second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are done. Which commission part. Us to the board of directors meeting. So um, I would call the board of directors meeting to order and um, we were here a month ago talking about branding. I think it was a month ago. Um, and thank you to the committee that got together um, to get more acquainted. Um, I really appreciated reading the, the notes of that meeting and kind of getting us all up to date on the branding. Um, so uh, do you have an update? Yes, um, Madam Chair. Today we're, ju we're hoping that the uh, NWCT board will just uh, take action on uh, this rebranding effort. And in fact, today, you know, this is a historic moment uh, having uh, CenturyLink here because now we're not only going to be on one cable system, we're going to be on two. And it all started when we were talking about channels and channel numbers and confusion with channels and kind of getting away from the channel aspect. So uh, now with CenturyLink being official in terms of uh, uh, some competition in the northwest suburbs and a provider, this is a perfect time to go through this, uh, this rebrand. Uh, of course, this approval would be a contingent upon uh, uh, legal review and trademark review by an attorney, so we want to make that clear. Uh, and also, um, we want to say that we're very excited to move forward with this rebrand strategy. And I want to recognize all, all of our staff and uh, Dave Kaiser for, uh, where's Dave, back there, for organizing and coordinating all this uh, effort. Um, there's just been a, a lot of work uh, from staff on this. Of course, all the city communications coordinators, uh, Helen Lefebvre, who's on our board, Cheryl Weiler, who's on our board, and then all the other communications coordinators at all the other cities. And then, um, of course, uh, uh, all the Cable Commission and NWC board members who offered their input on the process. And then finally, a uh, final thank you to Cindy Linus from CEL Marketing and Public Relations in Plymouth and Scott Rogers uh, for all their work. So um, we're, we're very excited to bring forth this uh, connected community experience uh, rebrand forward and, and remember that Northwest Community Television, the operating name would stay the same. It's just the rebrand of the, the, the programming and we're, we're very excited to move forward with this. Scott, you want to join us up here at the board or? You know? <laughs> so uh, I know we had a, a kind of lively discussion at the last meeting. We had a nice presentation. I don't know if all of you were here and remember the graphics and everything. So. Um, you're just looking for a motion yep. if if someone's comfortable in um, making that motion to move forward with the rebranding. I'll make the motion. Okay, we've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye.
opposed? I no. should have asked if there was discussion. I'm sorry, Rex. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be voting no simply because the CCX brand is so generic. It has to be meaningless, and I'm just not ready to sacrifice the 35-year history of the existing brand. Okay. I'm sorry. Was there? We voted. But was there anyone else that wanted to make any comments? I'm sorry about that. Okay. So we're moving forward with our rebranding. And is there anything else on our agenda? That's it, Madam Chair. That's it. So motion to adjourn. Moved. Moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you.